Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the first seminar of the year. I hope you all rested. Um, so the, uh, our first speaker of this year is going to be uh, Ankit Beniwal, who many people in the audience know because he originally did his PhD here um, in Australia in the uh, University of Adelaide, supervised by, by Tony Williams and Martin White. Um, so Ankit then went on to work um, in this uh, in the Gambit collaboration, which is something that, that I think a few people would have heard of. We had a seminar from Pat Scott, um, maybe last year or the year before, um, on, on this um, also. It's a very interesting um, collaboration. Um, so Anke is currently a postdoc um, in King's College London, um, but today he's going to be telling us about the, the work he's done within the Gambit collaboration. So um, thank you for uh, being with us, Anke, and uh, I'll leave it in your hands. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks, uh, everyone, for coming uh, for and being for me being as the first seminar for the year. So thanks, everyone. Yeah. So as Kieran mentioned, I've been I've worked on Gambit uh, a while now, and uh, this is one of the papers that we worked on a few uh, few years ago. So the start, uh, the title is uh, Thermal Wimps and the Scale of Near Physics. Um, this is based on this paper, which was published uh, last, two two years ago now. Uh, also. Uh, so this is a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I will motivate basically what dark matter is, uh, what the why we use effective field theories, uh, specifically, specifically in this uh, particular study, uh, why we do global fits, and why gambit comes in. Um, then I will explain briefly the the study that we did, uh, um, going through different constraints and likelihoods that were implemented uh, the nuisance parameters that went into the proper global field uh, before presenting the results and then summarizing the slide. All right, so, so we know that dark matter exists. There are multiple evidences for the existence of dark matter, uh, mostly coming from astrophysical and cosmological um, studies. Um, we know that it's about 85% of the total matter density. It's non-luminous, so it doesn't shine. It doesn't, it's believed to be non-baryonic in nature. Suppose it does interact with gravity, but we don't know if it interacts by weak force. Um, the one thing that's more important is that there are no particle dark matter candidates in the STAN model. Uh, STAN model is very successful so far in explaining all the all the anomalies and studies. Um, uh, so, so we basically are left with working uh, physics beyond the STAN model. Uh, one of the popular candidates includes the weakly interacting massive particles, which a lot of direct detection constraint uh, studies have been done on, and also the axion, which is uh, becoming quite popular these days. Um, I will specifically focus on WIMPs in this particular uh, uh, stop. So the, there are mainly three ways that you can look for WIMPs. One of them is direct detection, where you basically look for WIMPs um, elastically scattering of nucleons in underground uh, laboratories. Uh, some of the uh, recent ones include Panda X LZ, which is Lux Zeppelin, and the Xenon 110. Um, basically, you smash to, uh, you're looking for dark matter interac interacting with standard model particles and looking for the imprint that it leaves. Uh, another one is indirect detection. So, as the name suggests, you're just looking for signals coming from dark matter annihilation in high density regions. Uh, so, these regions would include the uh, galactic center or dwarf galaxies, which are very dark matter dominated. Um, then you look for these signals using ground or space based telescopes, and these are some of the examples um, that I've given. Uh, another one is the collider searches, where you look for dark matter uh, uh, by basically uh, standard model colliding with it itself and then producing dark matter um, in the process. So, this is the what's known as the missing transverse energy searches. Uh, uh, this missing transverse energy is uh, attributed to dark matter itself. All right, so then uh, we talk about the effective field theories, so why, why they're useful. So effective field theory is more, more or less a bottom-up approach uh, compared to, to the top-down approach where you have an underlying theory like SUSY uh, and you can make all the predictions. Um, in bottom-up approach, you include a bunch of effective uh, high-dimensional operators uh, that describe new interactions. So these operators are uh, these cues. And for each of these operators, you have a Wilson coefficient, a dimensionless Wilson coefficient, uh, which determines how the strength of that operator. And all of these are suppressed by uh, a scale lambda, which is called the scale of new physics. Typically, it is related to the mass of the, uh, this new heavy particle uh, that you've integrated out. Uh, the advantage of using EFT is that it's very simple. Uh, especially when the energy uh, scale of interest is much lower than the, the scale of new physics. 
So this is uh, very nice because it's uh, perfect for low velocity environments uh, for direct uh, dark matter detection and indirect detection. But you have to be very careful uh, when using uh, EFTs in collider searches because you can typically the type of energies you explore uh, might potentially um, end up uh, basically producing the, the mediator that you can't, uh, the effects of it, which you can't integrate out. Uh, EFTs itself are model independent, uh, which is a good thing about them, but then they're not very specific, specific to a particular UV theory, so there can be a bunch of UV theories that can give you the same EFT. So there are some, um, it's a double-edged sword in, in, in a way. Um, okay, so then before I talk about global fits, uh, what we know that there are many BSN theories that can explain dark matter. Uh, many of them come with a lot of parameters and constraints, so it becomes very tricky. Uh, the way to deal with those is to construct a composite likelihood function uh, given by this. So you have uh, a bunch of likelihood terms. Uh, they're independent of each other. So for instance, you can have direct detection, indirect detection, colliders, and, and some nuisance parameters. If they're independent, then you can write the, the, comp uh, the total likelihood like this. Um, there are, uh, then what you do is you want to use this likelihood and explore the parameter space. And to do so, uh, traditionally people have used um, various scanning methods. Uh, the simple scanning methods include the random and grid scans, but it turns out that when you use these in high dimensions, uh, uh, they are not very efficient. Um, more, uh, what I mean by inefficient is that um, in this case, the cons the likelihood, uh, the ninety percent percent confidence level that you construct uh, typically are not uh, not the right ones. Um, uh, I'll explain that a bit more later. Um, so the better way to do this is to use advanced scanning routines. Uh, some, of, some of these include the Monte Carlo Markov chain or nested sampling. So here, what you would do is, uh, the, the, for instance, this is shown nicely in this plot. Um, you have this black curve, which is the same as uh, just a, a composition of all the 90% confidence level regions from different uh, searches. But then the correct one is the red one. So here, you can see that uh, the red one, which is the, obtained through correct uh, uh, scanning routines, uh, sometimes exclude a parameter space uh, that uh, the, the original one wasn't excluding, whereas it's allowing more um, when it shouldn't be allowing. Um, then the, you can interpret these results. Once you have these, you can interpret them in either frequent or Bayesian statistical frameworks, uh, which is where Gambit comes in. Um, uh, you can also do parameter estimation, so you can uh, determine what uh, the physical parameters are, or you can also do a model comparison as well. So it's, again, all of this can be achieved through Gambit. Okay, so, so Gambit uh, stands for Global and Modular Beyond the Stand Model Inference Tool. It's a collaboration of about 70 plus people uh, with, coming from theory and experiments uh, groups. A lot of them are experts in some of the codes that people use to do calculations and colliders, um, astro, neutrinos, a whole bunch of other things. Um, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool, fully parallelized, um, uh, using, used for fast LSC simulations. Uh, there are various bits um, got for different, uh, doing calculation in, mod in modular form, or you can do all of the calculations together uh, using Gambit. Uh, just a quick uh, word on the, the structure itself. So there are a bunch of models uh, implemented in Gambit already. There is the core, and then you have the physical modules which do various things. So for instance, dark bit, that's the calculation of dark matter, uh, relic density calculation, uh, indirect detection, direct detection. So all of these can be combined together or done separately uh, within Gambit. Um, on top of that, we have some backends. Uh, so backends are basically, computer codes that people have written that we can interface to. Um, so uh, here, uh, some of these examples are given. Um, then you also have the scanner bit, which handles all the scanning routines. Um, and there's a bunch of new scanners, for instance, Diver, Polycore, that uh, were recently um, released, um, and they perform, and uh, they do various uh, things. So you can use these when you're doing a proper global study. Uh, using those uh, Awesome tools. Uh, what we've done uh, in the past is uh, we've done various global fits. Uh, the, the ones that I've been involved in, uh, in particular is the vector and fermion Higgs portal here. Uh, there's also similar uh, ones done for scalar Higgs portal. Um, and there's other ones for axions and right-handed neutrinos, flavor EFTs, uh, neutrinos, 
and a whole bunch of other Glow bits that uh, we've used uh, Gambit for. The one that I will talk about today is the, the Dark Matter EFT itself. Any questions so far uh, before I move on? Um, can I ask her just what well, maybe a simple question about the the plot you showed when you were comp comparing the constraints? Um, yeah. Doing the kind of advanced scanning rather than just stitching together a bunch of con constraints. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I kind of have a feeling for why the con the constraint would improve when you take when you when you take them all together. But what what's the argument behind why you have like a weaker constraint in some parts? Is there is there scenarios where that you can give me where that would be the case to to help understand? Um. So the weaker constraint would be, uh, I think. I think it's it's more of a model dependent question. So I think this here in in particular is probably a very simple example that we used. Um, I think it was like a uh, the likelihood function itself was quite simple. Um, but in in principle, it would depend on the the type of model and the type of constraints you have. Like some constraints would be more that uh, it will be more severe than than others, and they depend on the parameter space. So I guess I don't have like a straight answer. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So basically, like you can see, the, the main thing is the, the difference that uh, appears as a result of using the combined likelihood as opposed to stitch, stitching them together. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, I will move on. Uh, so here I will talk about the, the theory and the, the model behind the uh, model that we've used in the, uh, in the study itself. So, what we've done is we've taken this every very simple model. Of Dirk Fermion Wimp Dark Matter, which is supposed to interact with standard model quarks and gluons by, by a bunch of effective operators. So these are the operators that we've taken into account. So we go up to dimension seven. So for dimension seven, we have a, about 10 operators, and for dimension six, we have about four operators. Uh, most of them are uh, basically interactions between quarks and gluons. And the reason we only consider quarks and gluons instead of leptons is to, uh, mainly for collider searches because the, the constraints that we will employ, impose, uh, uh, most of them come from, the strong constraints come from colliders. Um, so moving on, so you have, uh, so have basically about uh, seven operators, uh, sorry, 10 operators for dimension seven and four operators for dimension six. Uh, then the full Lagrangian that you would be interested in is very simple. It's just the standard model Lagrangian, this interaction piece, and then the direct fermion uh, Lagrangian. Uh, to simplify uh, this, because you'd have this sort of thing for these operators for all six different quarks, to simplify, we make some assumptions. One of them is the minimum flare violation. Uh, so you suppose that the, the downtype quarks, uh, the coefficients, uh, Wilson coefficients are the same for downtype as a, uh, and they're the same for up uptype quarks. And further on, we also assume isospin invariance, which allows you to basically that the, the coefficients same for down and up quarks. So, Effectively, you end up with, uh, for dimension six, you have four Wilson coefficients, uh, the dark matter mass, and the scale of near physics as the, as the three parameters. And for dimension six and seven, you end up with uh, 10 from here. For dimension seven, 40, four for dimension six, so 14 and 15, 16. So 16 free parameters in dimension six and seven. Um, uh, the next thing uh, that I would like to talk is, uh, this is an important effect that one needs to be taken into account. So because we're dealing with effective field theories, um, and these operators mix uh, uh, with each other as you run in energy. Uh, and they also have, uh, have threshold corrections, which is when you basically, when the scale of uh, interest is below or above the a quark mass, because uh, certain operators mix with each other and therefore they would lead to new interactions. Uh, so these, uh, so for instance, uh, for the direct detection, the scale of new physics, uh, the scale, energy scale, sorry, uh, uh, has these Wilson coefficients have to be computed at um, 2 GeV for direct detection, which is a very small energy scale um, compared to colliders and uh, other, other things. Um, so there's also th threshold corrections uh, that one needs to take into account, uh, especially for the top quark. Uh, but luckily, um, uh, Fadi Bisher and the others, uh, Joachim Broad, have written this code called Direct DM, which allows you to do all of these uh, calculations. Another thing then is the, the use of EFT itself, uh, um, because it's EFT, yeah, 
you need to make sure that the we're using EFT is valid. So for instance, direct detection, the scale has to be above 2GB, uh, matches with the scale of 2GB that I mentioned about. Uh, for the scale, um, for relic density indirect detection, because you're dealing with uh, two dark matter interacting with each other, the scale have to be above twice the dark matter mass because dark matter is essentially annihilating at rest. Um, for collider searches, the, the missing strands of energy has to be lower than the scale of near physics. But for, for when it is above the scale of near physics, what we do is we do we modify this effective uh, this missing trans energy spectrum in such a form. So we set we call it the hard cut where you where this differential cross section is set to zero. But uh, you can also have a smooth cutoff, which is what would happen in a in a physical theory. So this is um, basically it's suppressed by this factor where this a is between zero and four, and it's what's known as a nuisance parameter. So uh, I'll talk more about that uh, later on, and what what that means. Um, on top of that, so we assume that uh, we can uh, separate out the, the Wilson coefficient and the scale of near physics. So that means that we can use the perturbative um, requirement on the Wilson coefficient uh, to put constraints on that as well. So you, you want this magnitude to be lower than the four pi uh, to have perturbative couplings. Uh, and for the parameter ranges, we look for this, uh, this range. Uh, the reason for using uh, five as the lower one is because uh, below that you start to get threshold. Uh, quark threshold questions and resonances, uh, especially in the relic density. And what we find is that above 500, the, the collider limits are very much similar. So it, 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 that's basically the cutoff. Similar similar for the scale of new physics, because we want to have a large hierarchy between the, um, the scales that we, uh, we pick. Um, okay, so this might be a bit long, but I will uh, try to go through this quickly, uh, because it's basically a bunch of uh, computer codes that we've used. Uh, to compute the likelihood. So the first one is direct detection. So we know we all we have all, all seen this form of for the differential cross section. So I won't go uh, so much into this. Uh, so what we basically do is that we, this uh, computing the differential cross section um, uh, equation eight uh, is very non-trivial for EFT operators because for one you can compute this, but then when you have these uh, different operators mixing and matching with each other, uh, it becomes very non-trivial. So what uh, what usually people do is they, they map these operators uh, that I've shown before onto non-relativistic dark matter nucleon cross uh, ones, which are these uh, OINs. So these ones, uh, they're functions of uh, dark matter spin, nuclear spin, moment, nuclear momentum, and relative velocity. So, so effectively, uh, the the Wilson coefficients that I've showed before, uh, they uh, are then matched onto this these operators. So for so this. Uh, this particular one will be a combination of the one upper, uh, Wilson coefficient that I showed before. Uh, here uh, is an example. So here, what I've shown is um, just the operators itself, and uh, whether they induced spin independent independent scattering or spin dependent scattering. So the ones which are suppressed, they are suppressed by either the dark matter velocity, which is very small, or the the momentum transfer. Um, the, some the ones that are loop induced that they don't happen at um, free level for for instance. So as I mentioned before, or these uh, Wilson coefficients, uh, which are functions of Q, where Q is the momentum transfer, they have to be computed uh, from the the Wilson coefficients that we have defined at a uh, scale of lambda. Uh, so these have to be matched. Uh, uh, there's also imp implicit depends on the momentum itself uh, coming from the RG evolution. So all of this, as I mentioned before, is handled through direct DM. Uh, so what we have now is that we can compute this uh, differential cross section. We can use the non-relativistic EF theory, EFT uh, theory uh, and just compute everything. So we then uh, so combine direct DM um, with direct DD calc, which allows you to compute direct detection rates. Uh, this is also part of Gambit. Uh, so using these two tools together, we can compute uh, the likelihood for a bunch of experiments. Uh, so for the ones that we've used is uh, listed here. Uh, the next thing that we look at is the relic density because it's a direct uh, dark matter um, in dark matter interaction. And also it's a dark matter candidate. It has to satisfy the dark matter relic density uh, constraints. So this is a very simple uh, form that uh, people have also seen, I presume. So this is this, the Boltzmann equation for the dark matter number density depends on the annihilation cross-section, uh, Hubble and, uh, and a bunch of other factors. 
Um, so how we compute this uh, tree level cross sections uh, using Calca, which is a very popular tool. We also use Gum, which is a new uh, tool that came out of Gambit, um, and also Dark Susie. Um, so all of these combined, uh, we can we can compute the cross section. Uh, because it's a direct dark matter, we, we do not assume any asymmetry between dark matter and anti-dark matter, so the number density is just twice the, uh, the dark matter density, and also uh, the EFT has to be satisfied, so this is the scale that I mentioned before. Um, we also are very agnostic about um, not having just one particular dark matter, uh, the one that we study here, but uh, we assume that basically there can be other dark matter candidates uh, that can saturate the dark matter abundance. Uh, so to do that, we scale, rescale all the direct detection and direct detection signals by the, the abundance of dark matter. So this is the, the fraction of dark matter. And uh, so for direct detection, it's just factors of one F, one of these F guys. And for indirect, indirect detection, because you have two dark matters uh, yeah, interacting, so you have F chi squared. Then the likelihood itself um, can either be one-sided Gaussian uh, which means that if the dark matter abundance for uh, the model was larger than the third one, you would have a Gaussian, otherwise you would just have a flat likelihood. So this is what the one-sided Gaussian is for the, this particular case. But if you want uh, direct dark matter to make up all of dark matter, then you want this requirement to be one, uh, which in that case becomes a Gaussian likelihood um, at the central value observed by blank. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, in this case, you, you don't include this parameterization of the the realm of EFT validity. You just you just set the constraint lambda greater than two times the dark matter mass. Yeah, yeah. So in uh, uh, there is, I think, I believe in, within Gambit there will be a study at some point uh, which will explore the the other region uh, and how how the relic density constraint can be satisfied. Okay. In that yeah. Um, okay, so so yeah, so these are so this table you've seen already, but then there's also uh, an extra column uh, about the annihilations, which is relevant for relic density. So you can see that some of these operators lead to S wave, which is uh, velocity, no suppression in the cross section bears for the the other ones. So there is a P wave uh, suppression, which is where when you have suppression uh, going like V squared, where V is of order 10 to the minus three C. So the ones which are P waves are already quite small compared to S wave. And some of the other ones are also suppressed by the factors of the quark mass compared to the dark matter mass. So they, they're basically, there is only a bunch of operators that will be very relevant. Uh, for the indirect detection, we have three different constraints. Uh, we have the gamma rays uh, searches from dwarf galaxies. So here you would be looking for High density regions like dwarf galaxies and Fermi satellite have looked for those and it has set con uh, strong constraints on the annihilation cross section. So I'll quickly flash those. Uh, so for that, we need to compute uh, the differential, uh, uh, basically, the number of photons you would expect uh, from a particular dwarf. And these uh, are com computed from using for Pythia tables. Uh, which are computed from dark Susie. So all of these are included in dark bit, uh, the dark bit dark matter module in Gambit. Um, then we use this uh, tool called GAM-like, which uh, allows you to take this data and then compute the permulate log likelihood, uh, which is done through here. So there's a bunch of uh, dwarfs that we've included. And for each of these, there's uh, the spectrum is given in various energy bins. Um, so the main thing for that I forgot to mention in equation 12 is that uh, the, the, the flux that you expect, uh, it, it can be split into two pieces. The, one of the pieces is the astrophysics part, and the other one is the um, basically the you know local cosmological part. Uh, okay, so so here, so we will, so basically this is the experimental likelihood, but then you see that this uh, like local likelihood depends on this phi, which is this flux part, and then this JK is the part which is astrophysical. So that's related to each both. Uh, so. Um, so to separate this, what we do is we do a profiling over these J factors using a likelihood uh, that's also been given in, in literature. Uh, it's a log normal, log likelihood, if I remember correctly. Uh, so you use this and then you can compute the, the actual formula to profile likelihood by maximizing over all the, the other J factors for the dwarfs. So effectively, all of this can be, is done in, in the GAM-like tool. 
Uh, the next one is the, the solar capture. So uh, this particular constraint itself is not very strong in, in our study, but uh, we included it because the, the code was there to, to be used. Uh, so we know that uh, dark matter can be captured in the sun. Um, and these, uh, this is uh, quite useful and especially useful for spin-dependent interaction because uh, it can lead to very strong constraints. So we can use sun as a probe for uh, dark matter by looking for high energy neutrinos coming from it. Um, so for this, what you need to compute is the capture rate, uh, dark matter capture rate, uh, which depends on a whole bunch of uh, factors. Uh, what we do is that we take these Wilson coefficients, non-relativistic Wilson coefficients, which are already used in uh, direct detection calculation. We use them from direct DM, and we pass this, this to a new code called Captain General, uh, which allows you to compute capture rate for generic uh, interactions. Uh, once we use those, uh, we, we check uh, how it compares against the post-equilibrium annihilation cross-section, which are computed through dark Susie, and then we compute the yields. Um, so once we compute the neutrino yields, these can be used with a new like, which uses the 79 string ice cube data uh, to compute event level log likelihoods. Um, so we have a way to compute the log likelihoods from that as well. One last thing from indirect detection is the CMB bounce. Um, so uh, this is there because uh, uh, effectively anything that can inject energy uh, in, prim in the primordial um, plasma will affect the cosmic microwave background that you see. Uh, so this can be used to put strong constraints on the dark matter annihilation cross section. Um, so for instance, uh, in this particular study, it's the, it's mainly the, the things, uh, the operators that would lead to annihilation into gamma rays or E plus E minus things. Uh, so the CMB sensitivity uh, is parameterized to, through this parameter, P annihilation, which depends on the dark matter abundance, but also other, other factors like the annihilation cross-section, dark matter mass, uh, and Planck. The one, one thing that makes it a bit complicated is because Planck only codes 95% credible region. Uh, so, so we need to basically, uh, in order to compute the log likelihood, you would want to uh, do the fit with all while running all the cosmological parameters, uh, lambda seeding parameters, which is quite computationally intensive. So what we do instead is we we try to constrain this p annihilation using this particular likelihood, which is more of a fit that we did. Um, so this is can be used um, to basically um, get the like log likelihood for that can you can use for CMB bounds. Any questions? All right, I will move on. Um, lastly, before I present some of the results, um, I would like to explain a bit more uh, on the Atlas and CME uh, searches that we included. So this is just the collider searches that we're looking for, uh, dark matter. So what we do, uh, what we are interested in is basically the two protons colliding with each other, producing two of our dark matter candidates, and then also a jet, which is the, the visible component. So this will lead to a missing transverse energy, uh, which can be compared against this jet. Uh, the searches that we included uh, were mainly the run two data. So this is involving 36 inverse phantom bounds of uh, data and 139 inverse phantom bounds of, of, uh, of Atlas. It's, so these are, might or, these are already quite old, I think, if I remember correctly. So Atlas is doing pretty, pretty good. Um, then the, the, we have to compute the number of events you would expect in each of the bins which depends on the luminosity, the, uh, the cross-section, and also this effect, effective acceptance and efficiency. Uh, all of this, uh, I won't go too much into it because I wasn't involved in the collider part of it. Uh, basically, there's a bunch of tools that people normally use to, to do this calculations. There's a bunch of matching also that has to be done and uh, detect the simulation, uh, which is done through Delphi's. Um, one thing I do will uh, comment on is that uh, on the operators, all the operators, for dimension six and only four operators out of dimension uh, seven. Those are the ones that are relevant for collider searches because the other ones, uh, they are either suppressed by the parton distribution functions for hybrid quarks or uh, they're suppressed by a uh, factor of mass, uh, quark mass, which are already quite light. So we, we basically have only a small set of operators that are relevant for collider searches. Um, Okay, so then there's a bunch of uh, signal regions that uh, Atlas and CMS have looked at. So you have to combine the uh, region uh, signals from each of those in order to maximize sensitivity. Um, so for 
Atlas, we combine all the signals, whereas for, uh, sorry, for CMS, we combine all the signals, but for Atlas, we only have one signal region. Uh, so we combine do this maximum sensitivity by combining the highest ET bins in those cases. So this, this just determines how the likelihood would look like. So for CMS, uh, this is the likelihood is slightly more complicated. There's a, this is the Poisson based likelihood on the num event number from signal and backgrounds. So There's also some Gaussian factors coming in from for the nuisance parameters. Uh, uh, so for in, so the ones that we use itself is the profile CMS likelihood. So what we do here is the, for the signal events, we basically profile over all the other um, 22 nuisance parameters that are entered in, entering in this factor gamma. For Atlas, uh, we do, so do something similar, but we try to get the best sensitivity. So uh, this is done, done, done like this. Uh, then the total log, uh, LSC log likelihood that we will have is basically the sum of these two. Uh, but we also do another thing, which is the, the capped LSC likelihood. Um, uh, we try to include this uh, just to, this is done mainly because uh, sometimes what we find is that um, uh, the thing does done, we don't want the, the model uh, to be too too far ahead of uh, signal, if I remember correctly. Uh, so it's defined in such a way. So you basically minimize the uh, look at the delta log likelihood. So you try to minimize the the, uh, the likelihood in terms of signal versus signal when the signal is non-zero. Well, signal is zero. Basically, signal versus background. Uh, so this, this is given here. You'll see the results, um, and, and you'll um, you'll see how how that affects it. Uh, quickly, um, before presenting the fit itself, uh, so some the, as I mentioned, there is a bunch of parameters. Uh, it's about six uh, six parameters for dimension six, and uh, and sixteen parameters for dimension six plus seven. And then on top of that, there are a bunch of a uh, nuisance parameters that enter in our fit, uh, which is given here. So these are they have quite a sizable uncertainty on them, especially the ones uh, like the the pi nucleon sigma term. Um, so they have to be uh, scanned uh, at the same time, uh, along with the uncertainties, um, to to get like a proper fit. Um, so this is uh, done. Uh, we've done that. Uh, so all of these likelihoods are Gaussian, except for the this local dark matter de density, which is log normally distributed. So the fit becomes very complicated in the end. So as I mentioned before, it's just uh, the log likelihood is just a product of these, uh, or sum of log likelihoods, or product of uh, likelihoods. So. A um, lot of physical parameters um, and um, nuisance parameters, so all of these uh, have to be scanned. Uh, the, the way we do this is to, doing a profile uh, likelihood analysis. So this is done through divers, so we, we only do frequent test analysis in this case. Uh, then you can do scans with the various settings. So one of them is the, if you want the distraction to be less than or equal to one, or if you want to, to be exactly one, you can do scans with capped versus full LHC likelihood. Um, uh, and, and look at the effect and also doing scans with hard versus smooth cutoff in the EFT spectrum. This is just a quick word on the profile likelihood ratio. So I'll explain that a bit later. Um, it's quite simple. Uh, then you can, uh, once you have this profile likelihood, you can use the Wilkes theorem uh, to construct ISO likelihood contours. Uh, There's a fixed confidence level. So it's either one sigma or two sigma confidence level that we show. All right, so any questions before going into results? Um, can I ask about the how you deal with the nuisance parameters on the, the direct detection side, particularly the velocity distribution? Because my understanding uh, is yeah. was that like you had sort of reverse engineered the direct detection likelihoods from their published limits, but those limits are like assuming a given velocity distribution. I mean, you can always rescale them for different row noughts, but how do you... How do you yeah. rescale them for the different velocity distribution? Because that's kind of convolved in with the cross section. So, so we do do have the profile itself implemented. So, uh, all the profile uh, parameters um, that describe the, the distribution, like the v zero v v escape, um, and but also like the dark matter distribution itself, um, the dark matter profile, that's also encoded. So, those parameters we've kept it the same um, to match with the the collaboration. But in principle, you can do this with. When you're running the fit, you can just change, uh, make the, the parameters of the document profile also nuisance parameters, uh, um, which we haven't done in this particular case. But basically, that allows you to, like, base, changing the param this parameter alpha or beta that parameterizes the distribution of dark matter halo. 
Does uh, that answer your question? Can yeah, I, I, I think so. I might I might ask again at the end. Of that. But yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll explain. I can explain that a bit more on later. Okay, so I think I, I set my timer to 45 minutes, so I have about 10, uh, but I can go a bit more if needed. Uh, so, okay, so in terms of results, this, these are some of the results. Uh, so the first one that I will show is the capped LHC likelihood uh, with hard cutoff uh, and F chi direct mode abundance less than or equal to one. So uh, straight off the bat, you basically have some parameter region that we won't be covering, which is the part where EFT is not valid uh, for, for indirect detection and relic density. So this is this gray region. Uh, the, the black region is ruled out because in, in these masses, in these low masses of high energy scale, um, turns out that the relic density and collider searches don't, uh, are not compatible uh, together. So that's why that part is ruled out. Uh, the region at low masses uh, with the best fit, there's a slight um, yellow region with the profile likelihood ratio is one. That uh, appears because uh, this is where the, there's a slight um, tension with the Fermilet data. So this Fermilet uh, seems to have, the data from dwarfs seem to have like a small axis that can be fitted by this particular model, uh, about 5 GV if I remember correctly, for the dark matter mass. So that's why that appears. And then the, there's a bunch of these uh, steps that are appearing. These steps are mainly a result of the, the different energy bins that uh, collider likelihood depends on. So as you go into different energy bins in the ET spectrum, you have slight, slight favor, um, basically. Uh, yep, so I think that I've mentioned already. So yeah, so this is, this is that. Uh, the, the one thing I forgot to mention is this is uh, the, the plot on the left is for D equals six, dimension D equals six. The plot on the right is D equals six plus seven. So you can see that there's a, not a big change uh, coming from adding extra operators from dimension seven. Just one um, quick question. Same. So yeah. sorry. Um, so it, it, no that, is there also a best fit point on the right figure or because I don't see the star or is that at the bottom uh, left? Oh, it's here. It's uh, I think it's here. It's like at the very bottom. Okay, okay, small, but it's the same uh, mass technically. Yeah, same mass, and it's also quite gen degenerate. So basically, there's no preference for the, the scale of new physics. Yeah, here. yeah. It's all like a strap. Do, do you know why they basically, there are the spike? There's that spike. If I, if I look on the left plot, there's that spike coming out right, uh, at lambda 10 to the 3, kind of 1 TV. Uh, while it's not there in the right, but I, I, why, what do those dimension 7 operators do? Uh, it helps with the collider searches. So, I mean, there's also uh, the gluon operators uh, that have been included in D equals six plus seven. Mm -hmm. um, so, I presume it has something to do with that. It could also be just the binning, like the, like not enough samples in that particular part of the, the parameter space. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd have to check on check on that. I can I can come back to that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, same thing, but then if we plot it in terms of the relic density, this is what we get. So the, the dashed, uh, let me check because I always get this wrong. So D equals six is the dashed line, which is this part. So if you just include D equals six uppers, you end up with a parameter space like this. Uh, so the main thing here to note is this part is that for the low masses, it turns out that for D equals six, you can, cannot get uh, the right abundance, but then if you include dimension six plus seven, you do you do get the right abundance across all the all the masses that we've looked at. Uh, so the, yeah, it's possible to saturate. So this uh, it's mainly because of these extra operators which are um, I suppressed um, in the tree level case, but then they, they help in the relic density. Um, we also scanned. Uh, we tried to extend the range uh, of dark matter mass. And also the scale of new physics, and this is sort of what we get in this plot. Um, we do the same thing for the relic density, as you can see here. You have a, uh, you can, uh, for low masses uh, below 100 GeV, it's uh, very hard to get the right abundance. Uh, whereas for above that, it's very easy. Low operator is being included, um, and then you also have uh, the CTA. So we also include a line from CTA in Galactic Center. Uh, so CTA has some good prospects for looking for high IMS dark matter, and that can be used to rule out some of the region. Um, um, this is mainly, but this is of course based on one particular annihilation state that we've uh, that CTA limit come uh, is used for. 
So this is the BB bar uh, that uh, we've used. Um, in terms of uh, the operators, how, how it looks in the parameter space, this is how it looks. So for this is what uh, D equals six, uh, dimension uh, six, uh, operator C4. So here you see that there's a slight uh, symmetry between uh, whether they're positive or negative. It's mainly because the cross-section goes like the, this coupling and this Wilson coefficient squared. Uh, some of these are more constrained than others, um, like C36. And it's mainly because of uh, how, they, how the interactions are, uh, appear as a result. So for instance, I'm not showing, for instance, C16, which is the one that typically is constrained by direct detection. It's the one uh, that gives unsuppressed spin independent cross section. That's heavily constrained. Turns out this has to be very close to zero. Uh, um, uh, but for the other ones, which are suppressed by it and the momentum, or uh, they're both spin dependent, so they're already in, uh, weaker in strength compared to spin independent. But the the C three six is a momentum suppressor. So that's even uh, that's almost like a second order suppression. So uh, so basically that's why some of these there is enough preference for this parameter space. And then coupling above like around 200 GV, that's where the uh, collider state has become strong. So that's that's why that sort of region gets uh, tighter. Yeah. Um, so this is the one for hard cutoff. So here we require the ones to be exactly one. So when you do that, then what happens is that the low mass region goes away. And it's because the, to, to match, uh, to get the right abundance, uh, as I mentioned before, like uh, in one of the plots, you saw that uh, it was very difficult to get the correct abundance below 100 GB. And this is what this is what's happening here. Um, the plot on the right is just a sort of a projection of what uh, the number of events in LZ might look like, which is uh, basically this. So you, you can expect up to order 10 events. Uh, um, uh, which, I mean, to just see how, how LZ goes, I suppose. Um, and there's a, this happens, this would happen if it, if it were to happen, it would be due to Q26 because it leads to spin independent and momentum suppressed interaction. Uh, okay, so then, uh, so the, the previous ones were with capped LSC likelihood. Now we look at the full LSC likelihood with hard cut off. Uh, so effectively, this, the picture changes here. So here, what happens is that um, there are certain parts of the parameter space that are favored. Uh, because um, there is there are slight excesses uh, that Atlas and CMS have seen, uh, so these these parts of the parameter space can be very nice, very good to fit those excesses. Uh, in particular, for CMS, it turns out lambda of around seven hundred GB, uh, which is the lower region, uh, yeah, fits well. And for Atlas, it's more anything above uh, one TV, which is this uh, the high, uh, the yellow region above one TV. And it doesn't matter between D equals six and D equals six plus seven. So, so that's quite interesting. Um, so this is again, of course, a EFT within an EFT, but what could be interesting, and I, I think people have already, Gambit, uh, people from Gambit have already done um, this, done this, where they look at uh, this S channel uh, interaction uh, or a T channel interaction for, of certain simplified theory. And there you can see uh, whether the, these axes still appear or well, do they are explained well. Uh, so uh, lastly, we have the smooth cutoff, uh, which is uh, basically this parameter, uh, this nuisance parameter A that I defined. Uh, it's uh, it's a nuisance parameter because in each of our the parameter space, we are trying to find the best fit value for A uh, between zero and four. Uh, so when when you do this uh, sort of technique, uh, take this technique into account, uh, basically all the the excesses go away. Uh, so here it, uh, there is a no the preferred region, uh, well, compared to the capped one there is, but uh, there is no gaps in between. So this, uh, what happens is that the best fit here, uh, it improves the fit with the Fermi LED, and, uh, but also with the LHC. Uh, so the Fermi LED was the lower one, which is this part, and then the, uh, the LHC was higher MS region. Uh, so for D equals six, best fit is around 80 GV, six plus seven, sorry, which is around there. And then the A, A is a folder around 1.7. So that's quite interesting because A of around two would be one you would expect from an S channel uh, mediator. Uh, okay, so given that I'm sort of running out of time, uh, I will just uh, quickly go through the summary. Uh, so we've done this uh, global fit of up to dimension seven operator for dimension uh, direct fermion dark matter. 
Uh, all the calculations were automated for direct and indirect detection. We've looked at this novel approach, uh, where we try to uh, address the issue of EFT validity at the LHC using this cutoff parameter. Uh, we've used highly efficient likelihoods and sampling codes um, to scan our or a dimension, 24 dimensional parameter space, uh, which is, I think, first one of its kind. Uh, there are strong constraints coming from low, uh, small dark matter masses and large lambda, but and there's a slight preference of dark matter signal and small lambda uh, um, as well. But it's mainly coming from Fermi. Um, uh, one thing that's more important to uh, highlight is that there wasn't a large hierarchy between dark matter mass and lambda. Uh, because if it were the case, then you would just violate the relic density constraint. There's also large regions around the space that are still viable, uh, even if you want uh, this direct fermion to make a pool of dark matter, which is basically keeps the, the limbs alive in a way. Um, so uh, before I conclude, I would like to say that uh, all the results, samples, and input files that we've used uh, and, and that came out of this study, they are publicly available as in order. So you're welcome to try to reproduce or check them out. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ankit. Um, we have some time for questions. Um, Who would like to go first? Ah. Can, can, can you explain a little bit more that capped LHC likelihood? I, I don't think I completely understand it yet, for what it does. To, to be honest, I think it's a, it's a very, it's more like a collider. It's, it came out of people from, from colliders, so mm -hmm. it's even more difficult for me to understand <laughs> in a way. So I think it's, it's supposed to compare the background. Uh, so like the has to minimize the, the background only hypothesis uh, compared to the signal and background, signal plus background only hypothesis uh, uh mm -hmm. it's uh, it's supposed it's supposed to like not uh, so that you don't see excesses basically like there are random excesses that you might see in a signal uh they have to be explained by standard model only fit i think that's sort of uh, mm -hmm. along the lines i might be wrong actually so mm -hmm. uh, but it would be it would be better if i basically check uh, rather than saying wrong things it would be better if i check and then i send you an email about it or something yeah yeah no i would be interested i i'm, I'm just curious because i've never seen it or heard it yeah and it, it came out in this uh electric mssm paper uh ews mm -hmm. mssm that uh people like martin and uh, others uh they've uh, they've used this uh, they've mm -hmm. introduced it yeah okay thanks uh, anyone else Um, maybe I can ask. Um, so on this this plot of the um, annihilation cross section, mm -hmm. so there was it looked as though there was a large. Um, uh, no, it was on the the next slide. Uh -huh. Yeah, this one. Um, no, this one. Yeah. So it looks like there's quite a big region which is substantially lower than like just the the standard thermal relic cross section that people usually write down mm -hmm. there are a way to understand what's allowing you to not kind of massively overproduce the dark matter in this kind of you know the bit that goes down to like 10 to the minus 39 mm -hmm. uh if, okay so so in this case cross section is very small so relic density must be quite big right yeah um but then i think it's it could also be just this fraction also and the cross section itself um, because the operators itself are quite uh, weakly constrained, uh, especially the ones uh, like the the P waves or the loop induced operators. That's why they're sort of giving you a very small um, annihilation cross section. Um, but in terms of, I think it. I mean, so there are there are models that can sort of give you that kind of cross sections and uh, that kind of direct detection cross sections. I think, like for instance, this pseudo number Goldstone. Like it has no chances of uh, seeing it in direct detection. Like it has like basically it's suppressed uh, by a tree level, but then annihilation in direct detection it might have some some chance. Well, yeah, I guess the the question then becomes: I mean, you have the example of putting CTA on there, and you see that you you can constrain like you know a little a little bit Very small. that region. Yeah. I mean, the the open region, putting all of your pods together. Like direct detection uh -huh. in like indirect and colliders is is there a hope to close it all 
Is it, well, uh, I mean, um, like, is it if you just take the indirect detection alone? I mean, ten to the minus forty-two mm -hmm. is just impossible. Um, it's, I it's pointless. Yeah. It's, it's, but it's is very... there is there a hope to close close it all if you take the whole parameter space with future collider, future direct detection, etc.? Well, I think well, the collider might be quite strong. Uh, so I'm I'm not sure because we haven't done the the fit with the latest results, for instance. Uh, because there's been uh, a lot more data being collected. And what we found was the collider was the, the strongest constraint out of all, um, especially in like high mass regions. So it's it's possible that, you know, around the, this this region, uh, there might be more things that are allowed and like there were, there's some exclusion, but it's hard to know. Just mm -hmm. off the top, yeah. Um, all right, is anyone else who wants to go before we wrap up? Maybe can you comment a little bit more on this? You mentioned in the conclusion slide there cannot be a large hierarchy for M chi and lambda. So that's, I guess, the. Mm -hmm. uh, I think here in that plot you have, I, here you have one. The yeah, left it's, it's, figure, more, right? it's more or less like this one. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's Kana, mostly, so, so what is mostly driving that? That uh, uh, is it? It's the, the colliders, collider searches. Collider searches, okay. But it's, but it's a it's a mix of it's uh, collider uh, searches are strong, but then if you combine that with the relic density and indirect detection and direct detection, it's like the overall it sort of doesn't work correctly. Mm -hmm. so it's like the 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 large mass is uh, large uh, scale uh, near physics scale where colliders would be strong, but then um, to uh, produce a dark matter of that mass and that lambda value, it's it's quite difficult. So then you're penalized by relic density. Okay, okay. So it's a combination of relic density and collider searches. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so I don't see any more people who want to ask questions. So let's uh, 